Privilege plays a role in a politically correct world, a world that calls for the consideration of one's own privilege in order to gain an understanding of a particular situation. Tonight, we're looking at where privilege resides and if one person's privilege is necessarily another's. Joining us now to help us do that in Edmonton, Alberta, Karen Strawn. She's a blogger and activist with Girl Rights What? And with us here in studio, Sadia Musavar, founder and CEO of Tech Girls Canada. Jonathan Kay, editor-in-chief of The Walrus Magazine. Desmond Cole, staff writer for Torontoist, and Catherine Hensel, a Shequipmook lawyer with a litigation practice serving First Nations and Indigenous people and organizations across Canada. And Karen, we welcome you in Edmonton. Everybody else here at the table, nice to have you with us as well. Peggy McIntosh wrote an article in 1988, it was called White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack. And she came up with 26, apparently, different signs of white privilege. We're going to share a few right now, which will help set up our discussion. Uh, white privilege exists if you can go shopping alone most of the time, pretty well assured that you're not going to be followed or harassed. Uh, I'm never asked to speak for all of the people of my racial group. That's another indication. Or I can take a job with an affirmative action employer without having coworkers on the job suspect that I got it because of race. Okay, let's go around here. We want to all understand privilege a little better. Uh, okay, Desmond, you first. Do you identify with this? Absolutely, I do. In fact, in the recent piece that I wrote uh, for Toronto Life about discrimination and racism, I cited two of the three things that you just mentioned, being uh, followed around a store, just shopping, and what was the first one that you mentioned too? First uh, one was the shopping one. Second one, I'm not asked to speak for all of the members yeah, that, of my racial That group. happened to me uh, this week as well, where I was making some comments about how the black community is being treated by our police. And somebody on the radio said, well, Desmond Cole doesn't speak for the whole black community. And as if you as if I were to do that. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it was an interesting commentary, but I think it lends insight into Peggy's findings from a long time ago that that wouldn't happen to her, but it happens to people like myself a lot. Catherine, you want to weigh in on this? Absolutely. I've had the same. It doesn't, I have to say, Toronto is a bit of a utopia, not necessarily for uh, African Canadians or black people, um, and not for all Indigenous people. But as a visibly First Nations woman with visibly First Nations mother and, and children that I travel with when I go to Winnipeg, when I go to Saskatoon, when I go to Calgary, I've been denied service. I've been trailed in, in stores. In fact, I, I expect it there. And um, I had a court reporter just last month tell me I was very articulate when she found out I was a First Nations person. So I you get was this. pleased with that. Yeah. Catherine, can I, I, I'm going to now say the first of what I suspect will be many dumb things during the course of this program. Um, to me, you are not visibly First Nations. You are not over obviously First Nations. Your name is Catherine Hensel, which doesn't scream First Nations. Yeah. So I guess I'm sort of modestly or moderately surprised mm -hmm. that this is a thing for you. In Toronto, how, how dumb is what I just said? In Toronto, it's not a thing for me, and that's why I'm raising my children here. I grew up in Calgary, in downtown Calgary, and in where there's a lot of Indigenous people, or if I go to Thunder Bay, Kenora, where there's a large visible Indigenous population, I am recognized as visibly Aboriginal, particularly in the summer, but you know, year round. Uh, people who are used to seeing a lot of First Nations people and recognizing them as such recognize me. Here, I could be Portuguese, I could be, you know, other Indigenous people know I'm, I'm Aboriginal, but not uh, you. Would, would speculate about my ethnicity. <laughs> and that has a protective effect. Not with a name like Catherine Hensel, I'm not sure I would. But anyway, yeah. <laughs> there we go on. Uh, Sadia, does that ring true for you? Absolutely it does. How so? Um, I think the, I can relate a lot to uh, what Desmond mentioned. But for me, my name is not one that blends in very easily. So there have been times where I know for a fact that the expectations of who I was going to be when I showed up were different. Uh, the whole being very articulate, I've gotten that lots. Uh, I am commended for how uh, well I can express my thoughts and share uh, what I'm saying without an accent. I don't know what that's meant to say to me because I do think being an immigrant and a person of color, uh, I sound like everywhere and nowhere now, but definitely can relate to that, yes. Okay. Jonathan. How about you? Uh, I think it's, I broadly agree with, with the description you provided, although I think it's important to emphasize that class is at least as mm -hmm. important as indicator as race in, in our society. 
And if you, even if you're white, uh, if you appear to be poor, if you appear to be, say, homeless, uh, you know, if you go into a liquor store, you're going to be followed around. If people suspect that, you know, that's the sort of person who's probably going to shoplift or whatever. Um, I think we talk a lot about race. It's an important subject. In my experience, from what I've observed as a journalist, class is at least as important a subject as race. Well, there are other things too, right? When we're talking about other nuances to this, race comes up often just because I think it's so obvious um, to, to make that distinction. But people with visible uh, disabilities get the same thing, right? And trans men and women uh, have the same notion. So the class part definitely intersects, but it's broader than the just race. And I think that's an important thing to talk about. Hmm. Let's get Karen Strawn to weigh in. Karen, we haven't heard from you yet. Where are you on this? Um, I, you know, I think that, that discussions of these kinds of issues are definitely important. And I think that there is a lot of value in discussions of race and the intersection of race and particularly class. Um, as the previous uh, panel has said, I, if you are dressed a certain way and you are in a liquor store, you are going to be followed around, whether you're white, black, you know, or even a woman, essentially. So, you know, there there is there's definitely room for discussion of that kind of stuff, and there's definitely um, uh, something to be gained there. But I think a lot of the tools uh, that were developed in feminist uh, women's studies and interdisciplinary studies, things like privilege and uh, problematization and standpoint theory and stuff like that. They were really designed to be scalpels. Um, and what the public discourse seems to be now, at least outside of academia, is, is they're kind, it's kind of being used as a bludgeon. Um, it's, there's, there's not a lot of room for nuance. Uh, so uh, essentially, there is, that, there is that concept that you're going to be expected to speak for everybody of your race. But the whole reason for that is because you're all expected to have the same or similar experiences. And while some of those experiences might be common, uh, you, all blacks are not a hive mind. All, all aboriginals are not a hive mind. So, hmm. I want to ask a very uncomfortable question for a change tonight. To keep this thing going along. And that is, I want everybody here in the studio, Karen, sorry, you can't do this, mm. to point to the person that they think is the most privileged on the set today. Three, two, one, do it now. Point. Interesting. Desmond's pointing at me. Saudi is pointing at the two white guys? Mm -hmm. OK. Catherine's pointing at the two white guys. Just on record, she pointed to me, and then she thought about it and pointed to you. That's true. So I think okay. that should be on the record. That uh, who did you point sure at, Jonathan? I'm not sure it's a competition. But oh, I just kind of went like this. Yeah, hello. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, okay. that's right. Okay. Um, I should I should add though that I occupy a, a position. I'm a lawyer. And, and, a, and a litigator, and, and I live in Toronto, I own a house here and everything, I, I occupy here a p position of tremendous privilege mm -hmm. as well. On a scale of one to 10, where is it? Seven, but it doesn't help me in Winnipeg, even if I'm wearing a suit. It does not help me, it will not help my visibly Aboriginal uh, daughter uh, stay safe, hmm. uh, stay alive, potentially. Class has something of a protective effect, but it only goes so far in, in different places and different contexts, and even in Toronto. Uh, I, I worry for my daughter. Desmond, I'm fascinated by your choice because some people might look at you and say you are a journalist with access to airwaves. You're a well-known writer in this town. Um, you can pretty much get on the air anytime you want. I'm getting there. You're getting there. You're about to host your own podcast now uh, on politics. Uh, how old are you? 33. 33. You're doing, you know, some might argue you're doing pretty well. Then why is it that I still get followed around by the police in my own city? There you go. That's why I pointed at you. Uh, you're doing better than I am, and congratulations I'm, on that, I'm Steve. 20 years older than you. <laughs> you are. I've spent more time at it. But that has something to do with your question, mm -hmm. right? And it's a fun exercise, but I think beyond just mm -hmm. you know who has the most, who has the least, we need to understand how privileges intersect, mm -hmm. where they are limited. They, they're not absolute things, mm -hmm. right? And I'm a man, so even though I'm a black man, there's extreme amounts of privilege that are invested in the idea that people see me and they're like, that's a guy. So I can't deny that, right? It's not just as simple as one identity or one way of being. Mm -hmm. But being a man gives you more privilege than a child, obviously. Yes. Than women, well, too? I, I, in many cases. I, Go ahead, Karen. 
I, I'd like to just interject something because uh, part of the entire idea of uh, driving while black or uh, this, the fact that stop and frisk seems to be predominantly uh, 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 targeting black men in places like New York City, uh, a lot of that has to do with the fact that you're a man. Um, it's not just about you being black, it's about you being a black male. It's not driving while black, it's driving while black and male. Um, so, Cause just, just, just so I understand, because if, if he were black and female, he wouldn't be getting pulled over, is that right? It, it would be much, much less likely to happen. Uh, when you talk about stop and frisk policies, about 95% of those targeted are black males or uh, minority males, but the 98% uh, uh, of those targeted are males of any, any ethnicity. So you're looking at an, an intersection of maleness and blackness that's leading you to be targeted in those ways. And this is one of the reasons why the discussion around privilege, and I find it really interesting that the idea of privilege has its birth in academic feminism, um, and then it kind of branched out to apply to all of these other areas where I think it actually is a better fit. Uh, gender does not fit the same model of sort of a uniform privilege. Men do have some privileges compared to women, and they will be taken seriously in ways that women often won't. But at the same time, it, it doesn't operate on the same, on the same dynamic. It's, it's a completely different thing. So let me ask when, Desmond about that. You, Hang on, Karen. Let me ask Desmond about that. Does that make you reevaluate your uh, decision or your position that being a male almost necessarily gives you more privilege than women in society. No, I, I, and again, I think it's very situational. Now, I agree, um, as a man who is also black, I will be stopped, whereas my mom, driving her car, won't be stopped, and she's black too. So that's absolutely the case. Um, there is a specific stereotype around black men and criminality that gets perpetuated in our media and in daily social life. And there are other stereotypes about black women that I am not subject to, mm -hmm. right? So this is complicated. Exactly. This is, this is really what I'm getting at, is that uh, it's much more nuanced. I guess, to forgive the pun, it's, it's a lot less black and white when you're talking about men and women. Um, it, it's a completely different uh, dynamic. It comes up through a completely different evolutionary, uh, both cultural and biological mechanism. So. Uh, it, I, I, find, I find it really ironic that we're actually taking a, a tool that was originally designed to apply to men and women, and it was a very, very poor fit, and we're finding places where it actually does fit uh, in terms of ethnicity and ability and uh, sexual orientation and gender orientation and all of those things. So. Okay, let's get some feedback here, Sadi, and then Catherine. I don't think anybody's denying that it's nuanced and it's complicated. That's the thing. Privilege in itself as a concept is simple because it says that just because something doesn't personally affect you, you deem it to not affect other people as well. That's what privilege is. And I think that definition applies to gender, to race, to sexual orientation, what have you. The, the way that it manifests itself is, of course, nuanced. And it's very interwoven into what our expectations, our stereotypes play into that, uh, what our cultural expectations are from gender play into that. So to, to spend a lot of time on where this originated and what it's doing, I don't think moves the discussion forward. I think we need to talk about creating spaces where we can actually have this dialogue and be able to talk about like you said, maybe I'm going to say something that would be inappropriate or dumb. Um, but we need to be able to say that so other people can step in and say, you are, you're not considering this lens. And have that. Um, learning opportunity. Learning opportunity. And I think that's where. I, I, I absolutely yeah. agree. But to pick up on something that Karen said, I think the, the male anal or the, the category of male and the vulnerability that might come and the over policing of males and inherent criminality, it only goes so far. Uh, Steve and Jonathan, have you ever felt that you were targeted because of your maleness, driving well male, or walking down, or if you're struggling in a public place, for example, or involved in some, um, uh, did the police ever do anything other than gently inquire after your well-being? Actually, I can mm -hmm. answer that question. Yeah. I can say that if you are a well-dressed white male minding your business in a place like Toronto, 
you pretty much have to punch someone in the face to get arrested. Like, I mean, you, even then. it's, yeah, and even then they say, well, well, what did he say? I mean, you know, uh, uh, no, and, and that is, uh, is he? <laughs> look, I, I sometimes mm -hmm. I'm, I'm generally skeptical of the excesses of political correctness in our society. And sometimes people wield white privilege in, in a way that makes me feel it's sort of dilatory. But it, it absolutely has made me think about some of the ways that, that white privilege does exist. And one of them is it's absolutely true if you are, uh, a white male or female driving around, walking around, shopping. Uh, as I say, if you're well-dressed, you can live your entire life without having any interaction with the police whatsoever, except as a complainant. Is that dangerous, do you think, for society at large? Because uh, that means, presumably, there's a big chunk of people out there who have no personal experience at all with what we're talking it about. It is dangerous. In the, well, it's dangerous in the sense that you get people who assume that's just the baseline of human existence. Mm -hmm. And that if someone has a negative interaction with the police, they must have done something to, uh, to attract it. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, by the way, I know we're not talking about income inequality today, but it is definitely true that the more and more people live in segmented neighborhoods, you know, if you live here in Toronto, if you live in Forest Hill, if you live in Rosedale, if you live in Moore Park, if you live in Leaside, whatever your skin color is, chances are the only time you're gonna see a police car in your neighborhood is maybe if they're responding to a fallen tree or something. Or if your neighbor got robbed and they're coming to do a, you know, a, a witness report and say, oh, I'm sorry, sir, did you see anything? Did you see anybody in the neighborhood? That is the only interaction you're gonna have with the police. And it's very difficult to, have par to be part of a civic discussion mm -hmm. about broader issues around policing or whatever if that's your only personal interaction with the. Let me do one more follow-up with you here, though, because um, I wonder if there's a part of you that finds this kind of a discussion frustrating at times because you're a part of the most hated minority group in the history of the world. <laughs> People may not know that, but you're Jewish. So you are. And yet you're s basically supposed to take a back seat to everybody else's pain, despite the fact that, um, you know, there's a long and proud history of hating people who are like you. Uh, Anti-Semitism has been described as uh, the most, most successful ideology of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's certainly true. However, on a selfish personal level, one of the nice things about being Jewish in 2015 is you can take it or leave it. Mm -hmm. uh, I have Jewish peers who have made Judaism completely central to their identity. Um, they, they spend their entire lives researching their ancestors, they speak fluent Hebrew, they go to Israel often, they care more about Israeli politics than Canadian politics. It is completely central to their identity by their choice. Mm -hmm. Whereas there are people like me who flunked out of Hebrew school, um, know very little about the Old Testament, and basically the Jewishness is an aspect of my identity that I can kind of go for weeks or months without really thinking about that much. And I can present myself in the workplace or to strangers or in the media as someone who, oh yeah, oh you mentioned, yeah, I'm Jewish, but let's talk about something else. I don't want to talk about that. Or um, it's incidental to my identity if I want it to be incidental to my identity. So you can take it or leave it, you can't. No, in fact, maybe your viewers didn't even know Jonathan was Jewish until you just asked. He, he, well, outed, he outed me, in fact, yeah. If they read his stuff, they know he's Jewish. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but he, re he refers to it. I'm not a closeted Jew. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm, 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 it's not, as I say, central to my public mm -hmm. identity as a media figure, but it's, yeah, it's a I, part of who I am, and I can take it or leave it depending on what we're discussing. I'm just saying that in the world where people want to make judgments on face value alone, mm -hmm. they can't do that about you. Right. right. They can do it about me, and they do. And I can tell you when I get, it's, it's jarring to me, I get off the plane, it's this immediate, I get off the plane in Winnipeg or the other prairie provinces, mm -hmm. and you see people's faces, they're trying to figure out, because I'm not a slam dunk, and they see, and they scan me, they see the briefcase, they see the suit, they see my face, and then a little scowl, mm -hmm. and a, a frown. A little scowl meaning what? Um, just they're identifying me. As, as this is non-Aboriginal people identifying me as an Aboriginal person, this does not happen in Toronto. Because, you know, there's 60,000 of us here, but it's not critical mass for, uh, and, and people are more integrated. By the way, this yeah. is another aspect of yeah. white privilege, mm -hmm. if I may say, you know, speaking as the privileged member, is that mm -hmm. if I do arouse that response mm -hmm. among people, mm -hmm. I can usually say, oh, what did I do? What did I say? I can immediately narrow it down to something that I did. Or wrote. Uh, or, or, or wrote, yeah. Uh, but life is more complicated mm -hmm. if you're trying to figure out, well, is it because of what I said or did, or is it simply because of my skin color? Um, so it, it complicates every social interaction, because <coughs> you're trying to decode that. To nuance, I would add that maybe when Desmond walks into a room or when you uh, enter Winnipeg, you notice that. I think people see my name. They've not even met me or ever laid eyes on me. They and see your maybe, name and they assume what? 
they assume a that I'm different. I'm always categorized in an other, so I'm al always having to prove that I am articulate and thoughtful, and my experience matters. And questions like, so where are you from? Well, Toronto. Where are you really from? Yeah. Is say a question. That? Where are you really from? Oh yeah, and this never ends. You could say you've been in Canada. 95% of your life and they'd be like, but where are you really from? And we laugh now, but this is exhausting. These are microaggressions that keep happening around us over and over How again. How do you answer that question? When somebody says, no, no, I, okay, I know you're from Toronto, but where are you really from? What do you say to them? I stick to my guns and say Toronto. I say you're from yeah. Toronto. But you know what they mean to ask is where are your parents or grandparents sure. or great grandparents from? Sure. And that could be asked in so many different ways in a conversation further down the road right. when you need to know more about me as a person, not put me in a category, label me, and then say, oh, one of those. Right. right. You don't get that, though, do you, Desmond? All where are you from? the time. Where are you really from? Oh, I'm from Red Deer, Alberta. Okay, but where are you really from? I'm born in Red Deer. Do you want to see my birth certificate? It says Red Deer, Alberta, in the hospital in Red Deer. It's not good enough for people because they're trying to get to another question, mm -hmm. as you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. But I really like what Sadia just said because where my ancestry is from might not be the first thing I'd like to talk to you about if I don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. It's not how mm -hmm. I identify. I identify as Desmond. I identify as the journalist. Mm -hmm. I identify with a guy who likes sports and music. Mm -hmm. But I'm not necessarily willing to discuss my... Th and, and by the way, uh, <laughs> there's very little follow-up when you actually give people mm -hmm. the answer that they're looking for. So when you say, well, my parents are from Sierra Leone in West Africa. Oh. And then that's the end of the conversation. Yeah. Does just, that suggest to you that it's not that big a deal for them actually? They're just kind of curious about it's, I feel the like condition? it's just one of those things that people do, maybe even out of discomfort. It feels like an icebreaker for them. It feels like a way of getting to know somebody, but they're not thinking about the idea that because that wouldn't necessarily happen to them, that it's not comfortable for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's not always comfortable to be immediately identified mm -hmm. as, you look like you're not from around here. Mm -hmm. That might not mm -hmm. always be the first thing that somebody wants to talk to you why about. Why do we go, we do do that, you know? Why do we go there? Well, we like to put people in boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the human mind can be very uh, limited socially. And we do like to put people in boxes. People don't usually ask me where I come from because they assume the answer, answer will be boring. Uh, um, and it doesn't help put them in a box. Instead, they'll ask me, uh, oh, you, uh, yeah, I've read your writing. You, you wrote for the National Post, right? Uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get it. Yeah, you know, like it's... Uh, but now what is that? They're sizing you up in a different way, obviously. They're How, sizing you up in they... a different dimension, but that is the way the human brain works, is that we, you know, look, we live in a society of strangers, and we meet thousands of people, and we need sort of devices to keep track of people. Oh yeah, you know this guy. You know, he's my conservative friend. Uh, you know, he's my uh, he's my black friend. He's this. He's that. He's my immigrant friend. And often these are you know sort of stereotypes. But this is sort of the origin of how prejudice works. Is that people like to categorize things. They, they like should, to categorize as insiders or outsiders. They should only know how disappointed people at the National Post are that you're really not that conservative after all. It hurts me every day. You know, <laughs> I, think about I, I would like to to underscore that. Yes, we all categorize and, you know, put people in boxes, but some of these boxes come with baggage and real consequences and some are just labels. So you write for the National Post. Hmm. That doesn't come with a preset notion of what kind of character you have, what your worth in society is I think and that what would depend on who you're talking to. Go ahead, Karen. I, I think it would depend. If you, if you write a, on the National Post uh, it, and you're talking to somebody who leans very toward the left, uh, people will, those people will essentially uh, often just write you off, write your character off. You're, you're a right-wing nutter, you know, obviously. You're very conservative. Lost and, cause. Yeah, lost cause. And, you know, I mean, look at, look at me. Uh, I've described myself as an anti-feminist. Uh, I know it the way I present myself really doesn't fall into what people are expecting when they hear that. Um, they see the short hair and the comfortable shoes and they're already making assumptions in the other direction. So when, when they hear that I'm an anti-feminist, often they just want to simply write me off as far as, oh, so you want to take the vote away from women or you want, want women not to have rights or you want women back in the kitchen, which would be something that I would absolutely not want to do myself. Um, thank you very much. But 
Um, you know, people make assumptions based on how you look. People make assumptions on base, based on certain things that you, cues that you give about who you are. And uh, some of those are choices, like writing for the National Post, and some of those are not choices, like skin color or, or you know, whatever, uh, your gender. But they are going to make assumptions. And this is one of the things that even the entire privilege discussion is a discussion of categories. It is, it is segmenting people into different categories for the purpose of sticking them in boxes of similar experiences. And I think that one of the things that, <clears throat> that, uh, that we can learn from discussions of this is that if we're going to put people in boxes, uh, that we're all going to have different experiences. And, and that means that some white people are, are going to have contact with the police uh, un, unjustly uh, when they're just minding their own business, like I did last weekend in Calgary. Um, so. Sorry, hang on, hang on. You can't just drop that and then not let us follow up on that. What do you, what do you mean you're, you're a white uh, person minding your own business in Calgary and the police approached you? Well, no, they, they approached a group of people who were convening in a public park. Uh, there had been an altercation. There had been an incident uh, where my group was thrown out of the Calgary Comic Expo, basically based on prejudgments that were made about us. Uh, they still haven't cited a rule we violated other than holding the wrong opinion. And uh, so when we convened in a park the next day in order for people to, who had gone, traveled to the convention to meet us, uh, they, the convention security called the police on us because hmm. they made assumptions that we were making plans about charging the gates and going back into the expo and protesting and making a ruckus. And that's just so not what our group is about. Um, but they make assumptions based on our political beliefs and, and all of those things, hmm. which we're quite vocal about. Let me follow up on so. this by, and um, I would commend for your viewing uh, enjoyment, uh, something you and I did last week. Desmond was here last week, did an interview about an article that he wrote for Toronto Life magazine uh, describing his experiences as a black man, 30-something, living in the city of Toronto. And uh, let's just pluck a little bit out of that piece right now and then we'll chat about it. When I walk down the street, Desmond writes, I find myself imagining that strangers view me with suspicion and fear. This phenomenon is what the African-American writer and activist W.E.B. Du w. E. B. Dubois described as double consciousness, how blacks experience reality through their own eyes and through the eyes of a society that prejudges them. Um, how do you tell, Desmond, what's, what's real prejudice and what isn't when you find yourself in one of those kind of circumstances? It's about experience. And um, some of it is really just about having spidey sense, as somebody might call it, right? That you have something happen to you so often that you are hyper aware. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that you're aware is when people see you as being threatening, when people see you as being dangerous, when people dislike you because of your appearance, that can be bad for you. So you want to be aware of a being in a situation where you might be being viewed as such. So I'm very hyper aware. Um, it doesn't mean I can see into people's hearts. And I'm actually not interested in seeing into people's hearts all of the time and saying, I know what you were thinking. I know what you were feeling. One of the things that bothers me a lot about conversations about privilege is that we end up talking about people's intentions. Mm -hmm. And I think we've established very clearly here that sometimes privilege means you have a blind spot. Mm -hmm. It means that you didn't experience something, and so you don't understand what it means. Now, if you don't know what it's like for example, to be followed around a store as I am. If you don't know what it's like to, to, to have somebody say, Desmond, your, your skin is like so dark. It's like so dark. People have said that to you? Of course. And they don't know the impact that that has on me. But Which is what? It hurts my feelings, Steve, because I don't want to be pointed out that way in public by somebody, especially by somebody who I'm not comfortable having that conversation with. Assume it was a white person who yeah, said it? Yeah, every time. Every time. I mean, now, there will be times within my, maybe on my own family, where, you know, people with different skin tones within my family will talk about that. But I'm more comfortable with them than I am with somebody who's a stranger or who is not black. All I'm trying to say, though, is that this is not about saying that the person who said, Desmond, your skin's so dark, has bad intentions. It's about the fact that what they say hurts. 
That is actually important to me. It's more important than whether they intended to hurt me or not. And I would hope that when I say those things, that a person would listen rather than becoming defensive about their intentions. Saudi, follow up on that. What, what does it, what is required of the person who, not intending to harm, but just through ignorance, makes a comment like that? And gets called out? Yeah. I think it's important to view it as a call for introspection and not guilt. I think it's, it's a call to review what you've said and to say to yourself, I don't know what I don't know, but be open to learning. So we often, as Asmund said, we associate this with malice. And that's why when somebody gets called out for saying something racist, they assume they're being told that they're a bad person yes. or all their choices are invalid because they have made you know, this statement which presumably shows their stance on where they view certain humans versus others. And that's why it's important to talk about the fact that they're not coming at it from a point of view to hurt somebody actively. Regardless, the effect of that is pain. Is there a place in this conversation mm -hmm. for the offending person to say, hey, I didn't mean anything by this, chill out? Which is often the less sort of amped up version of being defensive, right? It was mm -hmm. a joke, right? Mm -hmm. Relax, mm -hmm. um, which is trivializing what I have felt on the receiving end. So you're saying, A, you've hurt me, and B, you don't care is what you're saying to me. Mm -hmm. So instead of saying that, you could be forthcoming and say, I don't understand this. Why is this a problem? I don't think very many people who are on the other end would say, well, that's your problem. They would actually make a concerted effort to have that understanding. All right, let me go right? to John on this because the, I mean, the subject of this program, this series that we're running this week is political correctness. Do you worry that there is, uh, that it's gotten to such a place that somebody who offended unintentionally can't say to somebody, Okay, I didn't mean anything by that, relax. See, I agree that the best consequence of this would be introspection. People would think, you know, maybe, regardless of what my intentions were, maybe I shouldn't have phrased it that way, or maybe I shouldn't have just talked about the subject at all. The problem is that for a lot of people, the monitoring of what they say, their, their main experience with it often comes in universities or campuses where it is a highly punitive model. Uh, you know, I went, to, I went to university in the, in the 80s and 90s, which some might say was the height of political correctness. Mm -hmm. I would say punitive political correctness, in the sense that if you made a comment in class, even if you were a professor, if it was interpreted the wrong way, it wasn't just a question of saying, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. You could actually lose your career, or you could be expelled, or you could be brought up uh, before some kind of tribunal. You could be subject to sensitivity courses. The entire model was a co coercive, guilt-inducing model. And so that model did not encourage people to say, oh, I'm sorry, let's have a candid conversation about this, uh, which I think is a more productive outcome. It was based on a guilt and innocence model. And the idea was that racism was an extremely important sort of thought crime. And if you were found guilty of it, you would be punished for it. So I think that's a lot of the reason that people are defensive about it in 2015, is that the way political correctness came about in the last few decades, the idea has been that if you confess to any kind of bad sentiment, you'll be punished and ostracized for it. And you can lose your job. Karen, go ahead. And I, I think that that model has not disappeared, at least not in universities at all. Um, it, it's, an, it's a highly punitive model. It's a, it's a model where the offended party gets to impute intent, whether it exists or not, on the person who offended, um, and sort of a series of ethereal motivations that they believe that person had to say the offending thing. Um, and and you, you see now the degree of power that certain aspects, uh, certain branches of campus culture have to silence people, to, uh, to police their thought. You know, it's the whole thought crime thing. Um, even people who really didn't do anything, didn't say anything objectively that offensive. Um, you, can, you can have this, this huge weight of public shame just come crashing down on you. And not everybody is well equipped to deal with that. So, so there it is. Can I read something else here? Uh, of course I can, because I'm the moderator. Here we go. A Princeton student wrote about checking his privilege and learning about his Jewish family coming to America with nothing after the Holocaust. And here's the quote. I do not accuse those who check me 
and my perspective of overt racism, although the phrase, which assumes that simply because I belong to a certain ethnic group, I should be judged collectively with it, toes that line. But I do condemn them for diminishing everything I have personally accomplished, all the hard work I have done in my life, and for ascribing all the fruit I reap, not to the seeds I sow, but to some invisible patron saint of white maleness who places it out for me before I even arrive. Forget you didn't build that, the Obama reference, Check your privilege and realize that nothing you have accomplished is real. That's a different tweak on this. Catherine, what do you think? I think, I mean, and, and I, think, um, I think the university environment and the educational environment and what that young man's talking about, it's an incredibly important educational opportunity. I agree the punitive model doesn't work. On the other hand, Canadian society, particularly with respect to um, blacks and First Nations people are, is, it's not controversial that it's racist, that the Supreme Court has found it, numerous commissions of inquiry, it's, it, that's not controversial. How do we fix it? Through education. And undergrad and, and the public school system are really crucibles for it that, because people aren't going to learn about who First Nations people really are, why, why we are, how, why our communities should be preserved. Uh, why our territorial integrity is important, for example, they're never going to learn that at home because their own parents weren't taught and frankly their own teachers weren't taught. Mm -hmm. And it's an extension, part of the, uh, you know, a politically incorrect, insensitive, hurtful comment at, at a, in a school environment is an opportunity mm -hmm. to start to unpack that because for us it's a continuum between that t the type of thinking that gives rise to a thoughtless comment and public policy um, mainstream uh, coverage in the in in the mainstream press, editorials like the one that was in the Globe and Mail this morning that was uh, profoundly inaccurate and hurtful about uh, a Referring case in Six what? Nations. Um, it was full of uh, inaccuracies that and and drew therefore drew completely fallacious conclusions, and and that's that's our lived reality, uh, and so the comments. I, I agree that, that puni especially for a student, a student is supposed to be learning, they're supposed to be nurtured. And anybody we talk to, we should sp speak to with kindness and respect. That's, the, that's what we're talking about here, and treat with kindness and respect. So um, for the young man that, that was writing, the, the Princeton student, of course, he does actually walk around with a cloak of privilege as a white male. That does not mean his, edu his, his uh, achievements should be, are in any way diminished. It just means that he also needs to expand his conception of the advantages that he currently experiences and the disadvantages that some of his peers in society and in the classroom may have experienced. That's all. And, and you know, something else that I think we haven't said about this yet, too, is that sometimes university is the first place that people actually get to talk about notions of intersectionality, notions of their race, their gender. We don't do this very well in our education systems, and <clears throat> parents don't do it very well at home. These are embarrassing pe subjects for people. They're awkward and uncomfortable subjects for people. So I think that a lot of the time, what you see is you see people reacting with a sense of like loss and frustration that they were never able to talk about things before, and they maybe have experienced. Because here's the thing, some of that stuff is accidental. Some of it is unconscious. But sometimes people still do get targeted with overt, blatant racism. And they see a society where people don't stand up for them, where people don't make an issue out of it. And so when that's able to happen, for example, in a university classroom, people can freak out because they're like, how can this keep happening? I paid to have an education here, and I'm still being treated like X or Y or Z. And so I think we have to have compassion that when you, for example, suffer um, historical systemic discrimination as a black or indigenous person. It's really kind of asking a lot of somebody to be like, now calm down, mm -hmm. explain to us quietly and slowly how it works, don't get angry, don't have your emotions come out. That might not be a realistic expectation for somebody who's had to live with that and has never gotten to talk about it. And I think that's where the check your privilege um, phrase comes from and how most people react to it. The reason why it's viewed as confrontational is because it's often at the tail end of somebody saying, this is my life. I have to negotiate something that you don't give a second thought to every single day of my life. So there's 
a, a part of my energy, my effort, my sanity that goes into just normalizing things that other people just walk through. And that's why most of the time when somebody lobs a check your privilege, it is with an undertone of frustration and rage. Uh, but it comes from not just that one incident. Right. It is built on, like it's death by a thousand paper cuts. I got a quote on that too. And then I'll, hear, uh, I'll have John weigh in on this. This is uh, Phoebe maltz bovey writer based in Princeton, New Jersey again. She holds a doctorate in French and French studies from NYU, writing a year ago in The Atlantic. She says, use, use of the term privilege has, I'd argue, actually set back the cultural conversation about privilege. These ubiquitous expressions, check your privilege or your privilege is showing, ask the accused to own up to privilege, not to do anything about it. Do you get, um, you get tired of this uh, issue of privilege coming up all the time? Um, I, I have to admit, uh, it actually has made me think about a lot of things in my life. Um, uh, and it, in particular, it's, it, it has made me think about how things have changed for the better in some respects. Uh, I'm not that old. I'm, I'm 46. I went to uh, high school, you know, it was 30 years ago. And even back then, it was like a normal part of high school life that people would just trade around these ethnic slurs. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there, was, there happened to be a Pakistani, uh, someone who, who was of Pakistani ancestry, and we just called him a Paki to his face. Is this, what, what city was this? This was in Montreal. Montreal. Uh, Anti-Semitic slurs were, eh, sometimes in kind of jest, other times they were serious. Uh, there was an Italian guy, we, we called him a WAP. Uh, we'd make fun of people's names. And this was just kind of part of schoolyard culture. Mm. And I look at what my kids are experiencing now in the Toronto School Board, and if any term like that gets used in the schoolyard, I mean, it is, you go to the principal's office, and it is, they make a big deal out it's of it. It's a thing now. It's a thing, mm. and that's probably, well, it's not probably, it's good that we do that. Mm -hmm. um, so to a certain extent, a lot of the arguments that we're having about white privilege and um, political correctness, is part of a culture shift. And uh, for the most part, it's a welcome culture shift. I think some of the excesses that you see on university campus, some of the excesses you see in identity politics, um, some of the excesses you see in social media, especially Twitter, uh, I mean, they go too far. But for the most part, the movement to become aware of white privilege is part of uh, a welcome uh, and long-awaited um, recognition that there are people in society who just every day face casual discrimination at school, in the workplace, and in their neighborhood. I have seen examples though, I don't know who wants in on this, Desmond, I have seen examples of tenured university professors telling other people, you check your privilege. I mean, is there a more privileged person in society than a tenured university professor? I don't know. Do you know what I'm saying? I, I know what you're saying, and again, I think it's all about circumstances, okay, right? Okay, fair it's enough. It's all about the circumstances, but I mean, uh, while I don't agree with the spirit of the quote that you just read, mm -hmm. I think that there is some truth in saying, like, what's to be done? Mm -hmm. How do we move forward? Mm -hmm. And my frustration is that I bang my head up against a wall daily of people who just don't want to listen. Mm -hmm. And they will say to you, tell me how to help. Tell me what you want me to do. But then when you try to talk to them, they don't listen to you. And part of that for me is really difficult because I feel like I'm being disrespected again. Because they don't want to hear? Can I push back on that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I agree there, there are always going to be dogmatists in society who mm -hmm. just don't want to listen. But the people who matter do listen. Corporate leaders, government, the people who write our laws, educators. Uh, the people who really matter in society, who have the control in our society, are listening when it comes to fighting against discrimination, creating more comfortable environments for everybody. Sometimes. Okay. Sometimes. They not do. about respecting the treaties, not about uh, ceasing to discri discriminate uh, and chronic discriminatory underfunding of on reserve services for, children, for Aboriginal children. Not about, not about, not about. When people are, come up to me at dinner parties or when I'm on a panel or when I'm being consulted on a committee and say, what should we do to fix the terrible plight of Indigenous people in Canada? And we, I, the chiefs, you know, the leaders in the community, the elders tell them, and they're like, that's nice, we consulted you, mm -hmm. and they don't listen. And exactly. that is okay. public policy but, but, in Canada. But, okay, so if I can push back against that. You were talking about a high order of policy making, treaties and such. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the baseline liberal Western presumption that you can walk into a restaurant, walk into a store, walk into a school, and get the same level of service based on, regardless of whatever your skin color is, regardless of your ancestry. And that's, that's the baseline, certainly the baseline we owe people in our society. And on that front, I think we are making progress. That's not his experience. We have you made, know that, right? we have uh, made progress. I am not satisfied with the amount of progress mm -hmm. we have made. We are sitting in a city right now 
where a policy that disproportionately affects black men, which is police carding, stopping people who are not suspected of any crime, and taking down their personal information. This is something for which there is widespread support. This is something that Mayor Tory went on television and he said, this would never happen to my children. And then he mm -hmm. voted in support of it for other people's children. This scores and scores of black <clears throat> leaders, people in the black community, people who work with black youth, came and told the police board, don't do this to our children. Don't and do this to our community. Desmond, the new black police chief in Toronto supports this policy. He, I think he hasn't given enough, he's been given enough chance to really state how he feels and how he's going to move forward. All I'm saying is that you asked me the question when I was here about, well, what about black people in crime? It's always still about what I'm doing. It's not about what the institutions are doing to me as much as it ought to be. And I will push back on what you're saying, too, in terms of they're listening. Sure, they're listening, but is anything changing? I will bring you back to my world of, you know, working as a woman in tech, a person of color in tech. Everyone knows there's rampant sexism. Everyone has enough stats to drown in twice over. In the tech field. In the tech field. But there is this complacency that just because we know that it's there that it'll somehow fix itself and there isn't enough of a concerted effort that says I am willing to surrender these benefits these economic benefits that are tied to racism and sexism I am willing to surrender them because it is unfair that what I'm getting is not directly tied to what I'm earning John you want to come back uh, look when you're talking about employment in the high-tech field, when, again, when you're talking about treaty making, I, again, like these are, these are things that I think that ambitious, successful people should be talking about. Uh, I guess I'm thinking more about like really basic stuff. Policing is part of it. You should be able to walk down a street uh, and, and, and not be stopped and frisked because of your skin color. But I think we should also be cognizant of the progress that's been made in, for instance, hailing a cab. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, you were black, you hailed a cab, the cab didn't stop, tough luck for you. These days, you know, it just so happened I, I did a story on, on the way the taxi industry works in Toronto. Someone doesn't stop you because you're black, you get their cab number, they get hauled before a panel, they could lose their license. I hope and your eyes are quick enough to catch the cab number, but if I may just really quick push back one more time. These are on concrete it. things, concrete sure. things on the baseline of, of, of everyday life. I think it's concrete that those schoolyard taunts and racist slurs that you were talking about in a minute ago would not be able to be used by any respectable person in our society. Uh, former Mayor Rob Ford is not a respectable person, but he used all of those racial slurs. He used the N-word multiple times. You know what people said, Jonathan? Well, it was in his private time. He was being followed around, and he should be able to say what he wants in his own people, private no, no, mind. Wait, wait, wait. The people who matter didn't say that. And by I say the people who matter, I mean journalists, I mean fellow politicians. One of the reasons for... I'm talking about the public at large. Okay, you're talking about a topical. One of the reasons that... <laughs> what does that mean? One, <laughs> of the, <laughs> one of the reasons that the Ford brothers essentially were shamed out of office uh, for the most part, was because there was widespread public disgust at how completely uh, retrograde their language was. 33% of the vote, one okay, third, that's, that's okay, all I can say. But, but still, they, are, they, they became figures of ridicule and mockery in large part because their views were so regressive. Uh, and not just on race, uh, you know, everything from women to you know, substance abuse and uh, sexual orientation. Um, and you know, 30 or 40 years ago, they might have been dismissed as, oh, you know, that's politicians hijinks. Uh, what they do on their own time. And it is true that there was a segment of the population that saw that as sort of, you know, oh, that's, that's just clownishness. Rob being Rob. Yeah, yeah. But, but things have changed. And the reason we talk about Rob Ford, you say, you know, it's like a term of abuse to compare someone to Rob Ford is in large part because of the examples you just gave. I don't think anybody is denying that there hasn't been progress. Yes. Is it enough, though? It's so easy to fall back into, well, you know what, nobody uses the N-word on a schoolyard anymore. but. Okay, that's great. That's like the the bare minimum that we you can want do. A higher to, bar set. Absolutely. And and I don't agree with you when it comes to First Nations issues and Indigenous people in Canada. You can be in so called civilized society amongst a group of professionals at a dinner party talking about First Nations issues and it has, in my experience, degenerated into those people. Uh, don't pay taxes, therefore are not entitled to basic services, are lazy drunkards. That is not, that is unfortunately right in the mainstream in terms of social discourse. Uh, mm -hmm. And it, and it's, you know, I, I've, I've certainly heard it and I've often been told, except you, um, well, <laughs> thank you. Hmm. No, um, it, it is a main, even 
in, in my neighborhood, in my what I've described as a uto social utopia where I don't have to worry about discrimination and the safety of my children based on the color of their skin and their culture and their ancestry. I don't, but I've been at dinner parties where it's, it's gone to that and the third bottle of wine. The biggest problem, in my view, in yeah. my sheltered view, in terms of attitudes towards First Nations, uh, ties in with income inequality and the geographical separation of, of rich and poor. When I lived in Montreal, the only exposure that, that, that my friends and I had toward First Nations life was when we drove to a reserve to buy illegal cigarettes. In my neighborhood in Toronto, the only day-to-day -day exposure that people have to First Nations are when they pass by the local church and they see the church uh, feeding and helping homeless First Nations people who have come to the city to get assistance. That is their day-to-day -day exposure with First Nations people. And I think it's true that a lot of people have stereotypes. I think a lot of the stereotypes they have are just part of this segmented society we live in where you become beholden to whatever happens to be the snapshot you see in your neighborhood. Or and in the media, unfortunately, as well. Although I think media. the media has done a better job of late. And, and you know, the missing and murdered Aboriginal women mm -hmm. file in particular, there's been, I think, more of a constructive focus on, on some of these issues. So, you know, this panel isn't about the media, but I think the media, to a certain extent, has been part of the solution. Friends, jumping in, because we're down to a few minutes left here, and Karen, I want to bring you in on the issue of whether or not uh, the goal here is to create a world without privilege, or if that's even possible to do. Uh, I think it's not only not possible, I think uh, any measures to actually bring something like that about would be, uh, they would have to be totalitarian measures. They would have to um, essentially, uh, to equalize everybody at zero uh, in order so that nobody has any unfair advantage that, that anybody else, you know, doesn't have. I, I, I just can't see it happening and it, it's utopian thinking and utopian thinking we know where that can lead so I, I would really rather just stick with uh, an ethic of trying to understand other people try to understand where they're coming from um, but not necessarily try to engineer some huge change to how people operate in society. Uh, part of the reason, like I said, that we operate the way we do with stereotypes and, and categorizing people is because that's how our brains work and our brains have worked that way forever. If, if they didn't, we would keep eating the next red berry after the first one made us sick um, because we would not have the ability to categorize those red berries as something not to eat. So I, I, you know, you, you're looking at some kind of massive shift in human nature, and it's just not going to happen. Desmond, I think that what, you know, maybe I'm all for social engineering. Maybe I should put that out on the table, Steve. I think things like employment equity, which have been implemented sometimes by conservative governments, sometimes by liberal governments, sometimes by more progressive governments, that's an intervention into so-called human nature that I am all for. Mm -hmm. The reason is I can't wait. My family cannot wait. My ancestors and my children and the generations after me, we shouldn't have to wait for enough time to pass for people to see us as equals. We would like to achieve now. And if we have to do that by artificial, so-called artificial means, and I don't even accept that it's artificial because the idea that, for example, employment in Canada works on a meritocracy. Well, black and brown people have all the crappy jobs. Is that because we're not earning the right to have better jobs? We're not smart enough? We're not capable enough? Of course it's not. It's because of structural racism. But I would like to correct that structural racism through things like employment equity policies, rather than just wait for someone to become more enlightened than they are today so that I can get on with my own life. So I think it's important to talk about the economics of these things, because this is not just about being a nicer person. Social justice and the plight of indigenous people and black people and people of color and trans people and people with disabilities are tied very, very tightly with the economics of whether they're, they have access to jobs, to health care. Uh, and until we talk about that, this will stay personal. People will keep taking this personally and getting defensive. And we need to create a difference in terms of discourse around what we're talking about, which is tied to tangible things and not just your character or how warm and fuzzy you make me feel. Sadia, your privilege today is that you get the last word. Thank you very much, everybody, for a great discussion. Karen Strong, good to have you on the line from Edmonton, Alberta. And back here in our studio, Sadia Muzaffar and Desmond Cole on the left side of the table, Jonathan Kay and Catherine Hensel on the right side of the table. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning.
Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.